So good evening. Uh, I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and it's a great uh, honor to welcome tonight to the forum uh, General David Petraeus, uh, one of the genuine uh, uh, heroes of the uh, warrior class, and especially the thinking warrior class of the U.S. in Iraq today, a person whom I've observed and admired uh, for, for many, many years. David is currently the commanding general of the Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, which is an enterprise that he described to us at lunch today, which is an extraordinary learning uh, uh, exercise, learning the lessons from Iraq and applying them uh, in the training of American military forces who are continuing to, to flow back to Iraq. This includes the Command and General Staff College and 17 other schools and centers and training programs. It's responsible for the development of Army doctrinal manual, manuals, the training of Army's commissioned and non-commissioned officers, the oversight of the major collective training exercises, including, I think he may even say something about it tonight, the, uh, the uh, uh, facility that puts on versions of Ben Hur, in effect, uh, with uh, uh, with, an, uh, with the people for uh, for the people who are being trained to encounter as they try to think about going to Iraq and doing their jobs. So it's an extraordinary uh, enterprise, but it also is principally responsible for the collection and dissemination of lessons learned. So actually, it's a learning organization, which is a very impressive. Uh, 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 example, as we uh, heard in the discussion today. Prior to taking command of the uh, Combined Arms Center, General Petraeus served in Iraq for 27 months. He commanded the 101st Airborne Division during the initial invasion of Iraq, where they were tasked with securing the southern cities of Karbala and Najaf. Second, in late April, the 101st conducted what Michael Gordon and Bernie Trainer describe in their new book, Cobra II, as, quote, the longest air mobile operation in history, moving from well south of Baghdad to Mosul with multiple refuelings en route. From April 2003 to Feb 2004, General Petraeus administered Nineveh uh, province. The Kennedy School has a new case on General Petraeus, uh, and actually the case is just being released, and it was written by Kirsten Lundenberg. Let me see, where is uh, Kirsten? In any case, I don't see her. We saw her at lunch. Uh, and the case starts like this. I'm going to not read all of it to you because it's about a 50-page case, but it's a wonderful read. The city of 1.7 million was in shambles as much from looting as from war. U.S. Marines had just killed more than 15 Iraqis during a riot. The streets were in chaos, with police and security forces nowhere to be seen. The city had no electricity, no running water, no garbage removal. Shops were closed. Most public buildings and factories lay in ruins. There was no administrative or economic infrastructure. Addressing these deficiencies was hardly standard military business but there was no one else to do it. Petraeus found himself arbitrating a dizzying array of questions. How could he involve the Iraqis in rebuilding? Should there be elections? If so, who should stand? Could some Baathist officials retain their jobs? If so, which ones? How and who should pay the thousands of unemployed civil servants? What about inflation? Should border crossings be reopened for trade? How could he restart the university? Open banks, foster new businesses. What about the media? And underlying all these operational choices, a deeper uncertainty, could he establish himself as a leader whose decisions would be respected by the local community? So imagine showing up two weeks after, or a month to a day actually after Iraq after U.S. troops land in Iraq, and that's your list of questions. I think it's uh, uh, quite amazing. In any case, with no clear guidance from anybody, David Petraeus didn't know anything better than just to do the job, make the decisions, and move on. So uh, 
He succeeded in overseeing an area of 75,000 square miles. So his territory went about from Boston to Washington and then, you know, four-sided. Uh, applying counterinsurgency lessons he had learned as a commanding officer in Central America, Bosnia, and Haiti. President Bush personally asked General Petraeus to overhaul the faltering American efforts to train and stand up Iraqi security forces as commander of the Multinational Security Transition Command. There, for 15 months, he oversaw what was a mission impossible but succeeded in training and equipping, now there's 200,000 Iraqi security forces and troops, many of whom are undertaking counterinsurgency operations today, uh, independent of U.S. forces. General Petraeus' other leadership assignments are too long that he wouldn't get a chance to make his remarks if I went through the whole list, but I would just say he's a great example of people who've gone into U.S. military service and have served with distinction at, at many staff and command levels. I can only think of one uh, negative thing to say about uh, General Petraeus, uh, which I mentioned at lunch today. He's a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Military Academy. That's a positive thing. But then he took the wrong, only wrong turn that I recall in his career, in which he went to Princeton. Uh, where he uh, received his Ph.D. and wrote an excellent dissertation called The American Military and the Lessons of Vietnam. In 1991, uh, General Petraeus nearly died in a training exercise where he was accidentally shot through the chest with a bullet that just missed his heart uh, by a fellow soldier's M-16. He was medevaced to Vanderbilt's University Medical Center in Nashville where a young sur surgeon was ordered off the golf course to operate on him. That young golfer surgeon was Bill Frist, uh, now the leader of the U.S. Senate. In the fall of 2005, here at the, uh, at the school, uh, David Gergen and Warren Bennis co-chaired an independent committee under the Center for Public Leadership that selected 25 of, quote, America's best leaders, alongside uh, a distinguished group uh, General Petraeus was chosen for, quote, an open mind for a new army. So please welcome me, uh, please, please join me in welcoming General David Petraeus. Well, thanks very much, Professor Allison, for that very kind introduction, despite my taking the wrong turn on the New Jersey Turnpike. It's great to be with you all here at uh, ground zero of America's most important intellectual critical mass, at least that which is north of Princeton, of course. And it's wonderful to be in Boston, it really is, uh, even though returning to this city brings back difficult memories for me and many others of us from New York of that awful week in fall of 2004 when the curse of the Bambino was eradicated and the mighty New York Yankees were humbled after taking a seemingly insurmountable league in the American League playoffs. You didn't need to do that. And if I look a little tired tonight, uh, it's not because of the six events that the Kennedy School has already put me through today. It's actually because I was up very late last night first finding and then studying my old copy of The Essence of Decision, trying to remember what those darned levels of analysis were all about anyway. Well, before getting into my presentation, I thought you might enjoy a story that I heard uh, at a barber shop yesterday near the MIT campus where a number of the members of various military units and ROTC detachments in the Boston area get their hair cut. As the story goes, a Marine sergeant walked into the shop. What do you have, asked the barber. A good high and tight, responded the Marine, white wall sides and only a half inch on top. So the barber gave him a good close high and tight. How much do I owe you, asked the, the Marine. Nothing, responded the barber. You're serving our country in a time of war and I couldn't possibly take your money. So the Marine drew himself up to full attention, saluted, barked, semper fi, walked smartly out to his new red pickup truck with Marine Globe and Anchor decal on the back window and drove down to the Marine Corps Training Center in South Boston. And the next day on the steps of his shop when he arrived in the morning, the barber found a red Marine PT shirt and a Marine coin from the 25th Marine Regiment. In the middle of that afternoon, an Air Force pilot from Hanscom Air Force Base sauntered into the shop. 
What'll you have, asked the barber. A very light trim, responded the pilot. Just a bit off the sides, nothing off the top, and please don't touch the ponytail. <laughs> and take your time. I've already flown my eight hours this month, and the planet Hollywood at the harbor doesn't open for another two hours. <laughs> so the barber gave him a nice leisurely haircut, not touching the ponytail, and once again, when asked how much, replied, you're serving our country, I couldn't possibly take your money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Air Force officer responded, tossed off a salute, aim high, put on his sunglasses, got into his brand new dark blue Corvette with silver pilot's wings on the front license plate, and roared away. And the next morning on the steps of his shop, the barber found a pair of 80 aviator sunglasses and a scarf from the 66th Air Wing. Early that afternoon, an Army major strode importantly into the shop, a pager on his belt, a blackberry in his hand, and a collection of papers and international relations books under his arm. I need a good airborne haircut, he said to the barber, but please make it quick. I'm a professor of military science and a graduate student at MIT, and I don't want to be late for my next class on contemporary national security issues. After that, I have to write a comparative essay on the industrialization of the Pacific Rim, prepare the lesson plan for a three-day staff ride at Gettysburg for my cadets, and get in a quick five-mile run along the river. So the barber gave him a quick army haircut, and once again, when asked how much, replied, you're serving our country, I couldn't possibly take your money, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. so the major thanked him, gathered up his papers, and strode out to his eight-year-old Plymouth Voyager <laughs> with two car seats in the back and a Go Army bumper sticker on the tailgate window and sputtered back to MIT. And the next morning, on the steps of his shop, the barber found waiting for him five more Army majors. <laughs> well, please, don't ask me to tie that into my remarks this evening, but it was too good to pass up. And to anyone from the Air Force, related to someone from the Air Force, or otherwise connected, please recognize that I obviously used a little bit of literary license, I think. And don't cancel our flight on Saturday. But it is a pleasure to be here at the Kennedy School. It really is, uh, has been a wonderful day, actually, and, and it's an honor to share a few thoughts with you all this evening. Uh, my focus is, of course, on Iraq, uh, and in particular on observations from my time soldiering there. And in fact, earlier today, we talked about how we are, in fact, endeavoring to make changes to our Army in response to some of these observations and those of many others who have served there as well. Uh, as Professor Allison mentioned, I returned from Iraq about six months ago, having served in that country for the bulk of our first two and a half years there, first as the commander of the 101st Airborne Division, then a several week stint back again on short notice to assess the Iraqi security forces in April and May of 2004 after their poor performance in early April 2004, and then over 15 months as the head of the so-called train and equip mission. And following my remarks, uh, I'd be very happy to answer your questions, and if you'd like to talk briefly about the current status of the Iraqi security forces, uh, how we're incorporating our lessons learned in Iraq in various aspects of the U.S. Army, or any other topic of interest. Next slide, please. Now, note the coffee cup, if you would. Could you get this, uh, the camera on this here and zero in on that screaming eagle right there? Well, I'm going to work off slides. Uh, you know that uh, no Army officer is complete without a laser pointer and PowerPoint. Uh, we now have PowerPoint Ranger tabs, I think, that we're going to be issuing one of these days. And, uh, and I, but, it, but it is a helpful tool uh, to be able to lay this out for you. Uh, the first lesson uh, is something that uh, really affirms what T.E. Lawrence, the great Lawrence of Arabia, uh, observed when he was doing his own train and equip mission back in the early 1900s. Uh, and it talks about, again, helping uh, the Iraqis uh, and versus doing it for them. The truth is that it is actually easier in many respects to do something for folks than it is to actually help them do it, particularly in the early stages of a mission. And it's an easy trap to fall into. But the fact is, over time, of course, you've got to right at the beginning start thinking about transition. And the way to do that is to start right away as soon as possible in getting the good local leaders identified in assisting them. And we were fortunate, uh, we made a fairly big decision early on that we really needed Iraqis to help carry this very heavy rucksack of responsibilities that we had up there. We needed local help. The fact is that we really needed folks to help us chart our way through what was very unknown terrain. Uh, and I'll talk about the importance of knowing cultural terrain as well as the usual geographic terrain in a moment. Uh, the solution was to get Iraqi partners, and so we decided 
quite early in late April, in fact, to run a what really turned out to be a caucus election or a selection in which some of the outcomes were somewhat predetermined, not with the people, but with the makeup of the uh, interim province council. And we called it an interim province council so that if uh, ORHA or CPA, when they got established, uh, decided that they wanted to issue different guidance or some such that we could then say, you were interim, thank you for what you did for your country. Now we're going to follow the new guidance and, uh, and, and pursue that. So very, very important. Uh, we, th we think sort of decision early on to get on with this, and it leads to the next one. Next slide, please. Which is that it, from the very beginning, we very much felt that it was a race against the clock. Any student of, uh, of any of the, our previous nation building endeavors of counterinsurgency operations and so forth uh, knows that you have to get on the ground, you've got to get early wins, and then you have to try to sustain them as much as you can. We also developed a sense Early on as well, we could feel that although we were regarded as an army of liberation uh, at the outset, and that was true even in the Sunni Arab areas. By the way, it was even true with the Ba'ath Party members, except for perhaps those that you might call Saddamists. There was no love for Saddam and his regime among virtually anybody in that country who was left by the time that we, certainly by the time that we then did the move up to Mosul. Um, so again, there was a pretty good receptive desire to help us, desire to support what it was that we were trying to do for them. But we could tell already, we, there was a sense that this is going to turn into an army of occupation, in part because the expectations of the Iraqi people were so very, very high. We recognized this very early on. In fact, we used to call it the man on the moon uh, challenge or syndrome, where people would come up to us, uh, like this great young man right here, uh, who served over in, a, in Iraq, as a matter of fact, and say, Captain, your country c could take down Saddam in three weeks. You could put a man on the moon. Why can't you just give me a job? Why can't you just get fresh water pumping? And there's two other, there's actually quite a few folks in here for whatever it's worth. I thank you all for coming. There's strength in numbers. Uh, but, uh, but do know uh, what we were going through uh, during that particular period. And so we knew that there was a half-life to this sense that we were a liberating force. And again, it gave a real impetus to get going because we could already see as well that we are going to literally inconvenience the citizenry. In some cases, we're going to kill people by mistake. By the way, when you do that, you need to immediately admit it, uh, apologize, pay salatia pay, which is a tradition in that culture and society, and get on with business uh, and, and be open with it. But that led again to a real sense of urgency, uh, and we did try to convey that. And I think actually there's a couple of the, the former division engineer from the 101st is here. I think would affirm that there was a, a degree of impatience that was that was um, fostered by the leadership of the division uh, at that time. Next slide. Um, Early on, Ambassador Bremer came up to Mosul after he arrived. In fact, I think it was his second trip out of Baghdad. The very first one was down, I believe, to uh, the south. Uh, and then very quickly, he got out and came up to Mosul. And he had a really terrific day. He met with the interim province governor, the interim council. Uh, he was able to walk around the city at that point in time. Uh, of course, he got all the usual legal petitions from everybody. But it was a, it was a really good experience. And at the end of that day, uh, we got, went back to the airport, uh, got ready to put him back on his plane and, and head, head him back to Baghdad. And he went, we pulled me aside and said, hey, General, what do you need? Tell me what's the one thing that you really need. And I said, well, Ambassador, what we really need is money. Money is ammunition in this fight. And I said, you know, when we were fighting our way to Baghdad, uh, we could do with a single radio call, cause a missile to be launched that cost $550,000. And by the way, we launched 113 of them. That doesn't include all the precision Air Force munitions. And nobody asked us for a receipt. Nobody asked us for, for contracts or three bids. Uh, they just did it. And, and candidly, right now, there's a, an enormous degree of bureaucracy that surrounds the expenditure of even tiny amounts of money. And oh, by the way, we've spent all our cash anyway on school supplies, and it was operational money. And you know, gosh, if they don't like that, well, that's too bad. But, we got to get, we really, the missing resource for us right now is money. We had incredible assets at that time on the ground. In the 101st alone, which was the smallest of the three divisions in Iraq, the task forces at that time, we had over 6,000 vehicles. We had somewhere around 24, 25,000 soldiers. 
we had four engineer battalions plus an engineer group headquarters that does their civil engineers that do assessment design contracting and QA QC. We had reverse osmosis water purification units, well drillers, 250 helicopters, the biggest fleet in the world uh, of any division, uh, some tremendous uh, infantry units, two signal battalions. Uh, it just goes on and on. And, and I'll talk about later how we aligned each of those with various ministry activities to try to align functional expertise with the, the, the respective function in uh, northern Iraq at that time. The missing ingredient was money. Ambassador Bremer went back uh, down to Baghdad, and we mentioned, as he knew, uh, you know, that in fact our soldiers, as really the soldiers mostly from 3rd Infantry Division, had, had actually found some 800 plus thousand, or 800 plus million dollars in various walls and other locations that Saddam had had. Uh, and, you know, that perhaps that money could be used uh, for this purpose. It was Iraqi money after all. He went back, worked that through with the o, uh, OMB uh, back in Washington, apparently, and relatively quickly created what came to be known as the SERP program, the Commander's Emergency Reconstruction Program, uh, and did provide us uh, reasonable amounts of resources for that. The 101st, during the course of its time in northern Iraq, had about $53.6 million, with which it did over 5,000 projects. Small projects, little schools, you could do a little school then. We did over hundreds of schools uh, for less than $10,000 typically, refurbishments, uh, but water plants, uh, cement factories, you name it, across the board. Uh, in fact, we got some folks that were heroes of southern Iraq right here, two Marine lieutenants uh, that are now both at Harvard Business School, I might add, so they seem to make the right choice there. Tried to get them to take the right exit off the turnpike, but we'll work on that. But um, again, the key, the key was money. Um, over time, as the Iraqi money drew down, and we had a challenge in the September-October time frame, in fact, Doug Fife, who's here, I think, remembers us going back to the secretary, and they uh, got appropriated funds that supplemented that. Then there was more use of Iraqi oil funds and so forth. Hugely important. And, and as we go into something, this affirmed the absolute need for going in there with cash in your hands so you can immediately start doing projects. Next slide. I'm sorry, I, I, I should have made one other point there about the capacity and capability. It's not enough to have the money. You have to have it in the hands of those who can spend it. And there's another very critical element here because you do need to spend it right. I'm not talking about just throwing money around. I'm talking about using contracting officers, what are called Class A agents, who, so you, di you differentiate between those that hold the money, those who commit the money, and so forth. And, and so there has to be a process. I'm, I'm fine with bids and so forth and having a contracting process that worked out very, very well. But there does have to be accountability uh, uh, of that money. And so, again, you've got to have elements that can really provide that and have the oversight and the skills uh, to, to ensure that it is spent appropriately. Next slide. Uh, the next, we, we used to ask questions um, because we realized, you know, we'd love to have hearts and minds. We'd love to be loved. Everybody does, our soldiers, and we were no, no exception. And, in fact, that helps extend the half-life of the Army of Liberation. But the fact is, we came to realize the more important uh, task was to help the Iraqis love their new government, to give them a stake in the success of the new Iraq. And the challenge for the current government, frankly, is to give that stake to some of those who, feel, who don't feel a stake in it, particularly those Sunni Arabs uh, who, have, who feel that they have been uh, marginalized in the process along the way, and the new prime minister is going to have to take that on clearly. But we would ask a question, will this new policy program or initiative create more Iraqis with a stake in the success of the new Iraq or not? And if the answer was or not, then we should really look at why is it that we're going to do this again very, very hard. Uh, and, and that's a key concept. And the way to create a stake, of course, is by uh, getting them into the economy, job, creating jobs. And we had countless jobs programs, small business loan programs, home loan, believe it or not, which was a unique concept by and large uh, in Iraq, um, assisting with the, the launch of, of small initiatives uh, and all the rest of that. Next slide, please. There is also an operational question we used to use, which is on this slide right here. Uh, again, will it, this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by the way it's conducted? The fact was our goal as a general but very simple admittedly proposition was that we wanted to end each day with fewer enemies than we had when we started it. Now, again, I got it simple. It doesn't always work out that way. 
But you've got to ask that question if that is how you want to try to, to proceed. What this drives you to is very targeted operations. You, you try not to do big sweeps. You try to do targeted knocks on the door instead of blowing the door down. That requires very precision intelligence, which I'll talk about on the next slide in a second. But that was our approach wherever we could. And in fact, for example, in a single night in Mosul, uh, when we had a tough time in the November, the Ramadan period of 2003, we did uh, 35 simultaneous targets, got 23 of the individuals we were after with one shot fired uh, during the course of that night. All of those but one were done by conventional forces. Uh, and so, it, again, it can very much be done the key to that, again, was intelligence. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when you are willing to take more risk than others uh, to accomplish a particular mission or to get a particular target. And frankly, when it came to Uday and Kusay, who we got intelligence on, had them hold up in a house, uh, we were willing to take more risk. In the end, we were able to actually use some pretty precision uh, munitions to take them out after they refused to surrender and, and wounded three of our soldiers in two attempts to take them. Um, so that was a case I just point out generally to military audiences that, you know, there are times when you consider going, going hard, uh, but if you can avoid that, uh, certainly that is always the preference. Next slide. Again, to conduct precision operations, uh, there, are, there are three priorities, uh, intel, intel, and intel. I mean, that has to be the driving force in a counterinsurgency operation, and to do that, requires a pretty sophisticated analysis, uh, collection and analysis cell. And in fact, what we did uh, in northern Iraq, we were very fortunate to have a number of people who had been involved in uh, special uh, operations before, uh, particularly the hunt for the war criminals in Bosnia uh, and some counter-terrorist work. And we put together a joint interagency task force uh, very similar to what we had over there. And there were a number of us, in fact, that had been engaged in that and you've got to force everyone to work together. Non-cooperation is not an option. All the three-lettered three intelligence agencies uh, made way together with us on this. You have to coordinate your collection efforts so that you're not just doing a revolving door at particular sources. You've got to deconflict that, uh, and every operation was, was coordinated with us. Uh, in fact, there were a couple of times when I said, no, we're not going to do that when certain organizations wanted to do something uh, and in general, it was our collection and analysis capability that was, was driving the, the train and, for example, provided the 35 targets. But again, very closely meshed with uh, the different uh, other governmental agencies that are in the intelligence field. And we had every single one, and uh, frankly, and then, then some, plus some, a special mission unit component uh, that, is, that is extraordinary. But uh, again, pulling them together was the key, and we were fortunate, again, to have some folks that uh, knew how to do that pretty well. Uh, it is all about establishing these link diagrams. You see an example of one of those up there. Establishing the relationships among, uh, figuring out what the network consists of, who they are, of course, where they live precisely, you know, then all the way down to getting a 10-digit grid coordinate, a photo of the entry point, a description or photo of the target, the atmospherics of what you're doing, uh, and all the rest of that. And by the way, after we did these operations, we'd go back into the neighborhood the following morning uh, explain to the citizens why we did what we did, um, what the results were, why they were so, sa so much safer as a result of having this individual out of their neighborhood uh, and actually generally hand out Beanie Babies, which were really a very valuable component over there. And our chaplain had the Beanie Baby account uh, generating those over the Internet. Next slide. Um, I love civil affairs. I'd worked with civil affairs uh, units in Central America, Haiti, uh, the Balkans, uh, Kuwait, elsewhere, and I just think the world of them. They are absolute national assets. I could not believe our good fortune on arriving up in northern Iraq shortly thereafter to have two entire civil affairs battalions join us. It's a huge number of these very precious so-called high-demand, low-density assets. They were not enough, not even close. And we, we, we learned this particularly with respect to Mosul University, the headquarters of which is, is shown right here. Uh, we had the interim government in place. They had the interim governor, uh, sat down with them about probably the second or third week that they were in place and said, okay, we've got certain things happening now. The police are back on the streets. Business is coming back. There's actually free enterprise out there. Uh, we'd even found some money. We're going to pay the civil, uh, civil service workers, by the way. 
Uh, we'd figured out if we dumped money on a closed economy, by the way, would produce inflation, so we reopened the border and got more goods in the marketplace. Uh, but then uh, they said, well, the next priority needs to be Mosul University. We've got to reopen the university. Uh, we don't want to lose the school year for those students who are in there. We thought that was very commendable and very impressive and, and showed a real commitment to higher education, which is something that Mosul is known for and always has been, arguably the best university in Iraq. Uh, some will say Baghdad, but big place, 30 to 35,000 students, bigger than the University of Michigan, over 100 major structures, uh, 400 some, or 4,000 some faculty and staff, um, had no idea the size of it, but I said, okay, I'll go over there, I'll take a look at it, and you know, I thought this will be easy, we'll go over, check it out, talk to the chancellor, see what we need to do, and get on with it. So I went over there and met with the chancellor, who, by the way, is late, very late 60s, he's a PhD from the United Kingdom, a uh, very impressive individual, uh, and all the deans of his 18 or 19 colleges were actually of similar credentials and, 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 and experience. Um, and, you know, he laid it out, we took a drive around this very big campus, uh, and I realized every single building in here had been looted horribly. There was absolutely no furniture left, no computers left whatsoever, no windows left, no fans, air conditioners, no wires, anything, uh, and no books, uh, absolutely nothing. So we, this looked now like a pretty daunting task. Next stop was the Civil Affairs Battalion that was in Mosul. Sat down with him, said, okay, what do you got, big guy? You know, we need to rebuild Mosul University. Ah, oh, easy money, he said, sir. We got this great education team, got this great captain, taught elementary school one time. Got a couple sergeants, a couple drivers. I mean, we're good to go. We'll have this thing up and operational. I said, hey, you've been over there lately. He said, oh, no. I said, this is not Orange County Community College we're talking about here. <laughs> so anyway, um, went up to the headquarters and said, guys, what are we going to do? Let's put our thinking caps on. And so uh, we looked at our task organization. We had an aviation brigade. We had two aviation brigades. One was very heavily engaged back in Anbar province doing counter-terrorist stuff with uh, a variety of package that we put together for that. The other one, though, was not as heavily engaged. So I called up that colonel. The colonel has a staff. He's got engineers. He's got contractors. He's got class A agents. He's got lawyers. He's got signal officers. He's got the whole nine yards. He's got educated guys, plenty of officers with higher education degrees and everything else. Uh, you know, 100 helicopters to take the chancellor back and forth to Baghdad, which is a pretty constant drill in that country. Uh, and so called him up and said, congratulations, you won the lottery, you get to rebuild Mosley University. He said, okay, who? Um, and so I said, you know, go check it out, let me know what you need, I'll give you half of that, and then we'll get after it. I didn't actually say that, but that's about what he got. Um, so anyway, he, he went, took a look, and he got, you know, of course, he had four or five battalion commanders, and so they, you know, they got involved now, and they each had three or four company commanders, and they all, you know, so pretty soon you get a company covered down on each college, and Got a lot of great American ingenuity. Turns out some of the warrant officer aviators was, you know, network systems managers in earlier life. We had some part-time, you know, woodworkers and guys that knew electricity and all the rest of that. And then we hired lots of lots of Iraqis. There was tremendous talent in the Iraqi workforce uh, and the number of engineers and all the rest of that. Long story short, three weeks later, we actually had it reopened. Yes, it was 120 degrees out in, and inside. Um, but they did complete the classes, and we kept improving it, of course, and then they did complete the uh, final exams, and it was one of two places in all of Iraq that year that did complete uh, the school year, which was, again, not just symbolic. It was really, to them, substantively very, very important. We learned big time from that. We said, okay, look, let's now figure out what is every ministry activity that's up here, what functional uh, expertise do they require, and then let's look at our task organization, all these assets I talked about, and let's align a unit with every single ministry that, ha and ideally there's functional uh, expertise. So you take the Ministry of Telecommunications, Signal Battalion, that's a natural. And they literally rewired all of northern Iraq where it needed to. They're, gosh, they even got 300 kilometers of fiber optic cable donated by Bell South that made its way on a plane over to us somehow. Uh, the engineer battalion, in fact, right here, great Colonel Duke DeLuca, a fellow uh, upstairs here, uh, ended up partnered with the Ministry of Public Works, uh, and, and on and on and on. And, and then individuals had portfolios. Mine was the governor of Nineveh province and the two Kurdish leaders, Masoud Barzani and Jalal Talibani, had liaison officers and teams with each of them uh, and all the rest of that. That then got somebody, and, and again, a mission intent, get after it, you know, go do it. You know what you need to do. 
go check it out, assess it, figure out what needs to be done, and let's just start doing it. And I'll come out and see how you're doing. Don't worry about sending a thousand reports, just get after it. And it, and it worked pretty well. And, uh, and I think that's the, the bottom line. And again, the real bottom line is there's a time and place when everybody does nation building, and that was clearly one of them. Next slide. Um, we learned, especially during the train and equip mission, which really is much more than just training and equip. I'd be happy to talk about it later, but it is organized is the first big issue. Literally, what should the structure of these armed forces be? Um, what should their missions be? How should you conceive them? Where should they be based? What's the chain of command? All the rest of this kind of stuff. Then training, then equipping, uh, rebuilding. Duke DeLuca, in fact, we brought him back over for another year, and he rebuilt $2 billion worth of, uh, of Iraqi security force infrastructure. Remember those numbers now, $2 billion. That effort was over $12 billion. Um, this was huge and uh, incredibly comprehensive. And it was built, by the way. And he can tell you how to do stuff in that kind of environment because he learned some very, very important lessons, a lot of which we're capturing now at a new organization at Fort Levin with the Secretary Rumsfeld mandated would be established out there. Uh, but the bottom line was that we learned that you can't just train battalions, brigades, and divisions. You've got to rebuild institutions. You've got to figure out what military academies, staff schools, all the rest of this. Because what you're trying to do is not just, again, train units. You're trying to change a culture, an institutional culture. You're trying to rebuild an institution and hopefully in a slightly better way than, than had crept into certain elements, certainly, of the, the military culture and the police culture, the Ministry of Interior culture uh, in Iraq. Big challenge. Don't in any way want to make light of the, the continuing enormous challenges, but also uh, I'm, I'm rel relatively proud of what has been accomplished in that arena, but a key recognition was that we got to help stand up again these ministries, these organizations that support the soldiers, and in fact it is still the shortcoming that holds back some of the battalions is the inability uh, to support with the overall logistical uh, structure and also the, the personnel and, and policy apparatus. Big progress, still a long way to go. Next slide. And I'd be happy to talk about that later if somebody wants to. You know, anybody that's studied any kind of counterinsurgency operations knows very, very well that it's much more than just military operations. Uh, in fact, Galula in his classic work says there's something in there that, that um, the, the military component somewhere around 10 to 20 percent and the rest of it is, is, is the rest of it. And in fact, uh, the bigger component, certainly in Iraq right now and for some time, has actually been, as you all know, the political environment, that, that component. And in fact, I remember there were journalists that asked me after the bombing of the Gold Dome Mosque in Samara whether or not the security forces would hold together. And I said, well, A, I do think they will, but B, you're asking the wrong question. The real question is, will the Iraqi political leadership hold together? If it does, very much the security forces will hold together. Don't worry about that. The key is, in fact, uh, the, the political component of it, and I'll talk later about even the different levels of that, uh, but it's much, much more, of course. Uh, it's also jobs. It's education that opens up their eyes to the outside world. It's initiatives to get, in this case, neighboring countries, Syria and Iran, to, to be a little bit more benevolent in what their activities are. Uh, it's getting the lights back on. It's getting the water flowing reliably. All those types of of components. And so on occasion when congressional delegations would say, you know, what's the magic number in Iraqi security forces at which our numbers can go down, uh, I'd say it's not that simple. The equation, if you want to say an equation that says drawdown of U.S. forces equals, yes, one factor clearly is Iraqi security forces. But I don't think the coefficient in front of that factor is the biggest one. I think the big coefficient should be in front of the political environment one. And then there's a sizable co co coefficient in front of general level of employment, of basic services, and of these other factors that are up here. And those are the keys uh, to the way ahead. Next slide, please. Um, we really learned early on that knowledge of the cultural terrain uh, of these factors that are shown up here uh, is clearly, if not as important, uh, maybe more important than uh, the knowledge of the traditional terrain. You know, military guys, what we tend to focus on, what I certainly was focused on in the fight to Baghdad, certainly at the outset, was where's the high ground, literally? You know, how big is the escarpment outside Najaf? Uh, what's, what's the range from here to there relative to our weapons ranges? Um, 
uh, what's the dust condition? You know, we're putting 200 helicopters at one point in one huge area out in the desert, you know, the size of a, of a large county. Uh, is the dust going to be so bad that we are literally going to crash helicopters as we try to land them at night? By the way, we did crash a helicopter because of dust conditions at night. Pilots were okay, but um, this is big stuff, and this is the kind of stuff that we typically focus on. Needless to say, very quickly we learned uh, or relearned or reaffirmed the importance of knowing all of these other factors if you're going to do counterinsurgency operations with a degree of, uh, of sensitivity, I guess, if you will, a degree of, of cultural awareness and, and operating again in, some, in a place that is very, very different uh, from our own societies. Uh, I mentioned earlier today, as a matter of fact, for whatever it's worth, that the kind of flexibility and adaptability that that our leaders need to operate in different cultures, in many cases, is facilitated best by out of the intellectual comfort zone experiences, such as those that they get uh, at a civilian graduate school. And in fact, I, I was really pleased to see several uh, Army officers that are here, in fact, and they're getting their out of the comf intellectual comfort zone experience, I hope. Next slide, please. Um, this is the piece I talked about with. By local leaders, what I really mean is, in this case, Iraqi leaders. It's not local as in, uh, say, provincial or district or city. Uh, but there are indeed four different levels of leadership that are distinct in terms of their development. In fact, the national level has now really done a pretty, uh, pretty important uh, step forward uh, by the selection of a prime minister now and the other key leaders at the very top. Um, they now, of course, must take the next step and, and select what is very, very important, the ministry leaders. Uh, and it's critical to remember that in a society like Iraq, all resources funnel to the people through the ministries. This is still very, very much the traditional command economy model. Uh, so any good that is done for the Iraqi people uh, is going to be done by money that is, for, by the way, they've raised $7 billion already this year in oil uh, revenues alone. It all goes to a bank in New York, it then makes its way across to Iraq as cash. This is a cash economy. There, is no, uh, there are no banks to which you can do wire transfers. There's no check to bank. There's none of that kind of stuff. It is all cash, uh, which, by the way, creates a rather substantial challenge for our, the soldiers in the Iraqi security forces because they have to take money home about every six weeks. And this is not a trivial, trivial affair. If you're from Mosul and you're serving, or more likely from Basra serving up in Nineveh province, it is a very big endeavor. And there was a period when the enemy was targeting them when they were moving, uh, and it was a very, very, very serious challenge. And the Iraqis actually finally have solved that themselves. Uh, but the ministry level is hugely important. And we talked today earlier about the very vital necessity of uh, helping the Ministry of Finance in particular be able to digest the money and then push it out uh, with reasonable, you know, enough bureaucracy to ensure that, you know, it doesn't get you put to sort of corrupt uses, if you will, or siphoned off, uh, but it gets to the other ministries. So again, it can do good for the Iraqi people and for the activities of, of the various ministries. Needless to say, the agriculture ministry, the uh, oil ministry, we have the, the, the ministries of defense and interior pretty well covered down on now. In fact, that mission was combined with the overall mission of the Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq uh, about a month or so before I left Iraq uh, last year. Uh, at the province level, very important that provincial leaders do not uh, employ winner-takes-all politics. There have to be uh, sort of minimum rights for the minorities. Uh, and the challenge typically has been that, okay, I've just been elected the governor. I'm from Skiri or Dawa or McSodder's uh, uh, party. I want a province police chief who's from that same party. And that, of course, wreaks havoc with what you're trying to do in terms of professionalization of security forces. And it's something that we threw ourselves on the railroad tracks in front of every time uh, we could get uh, see it coming. Uh, and then, of course, within the security forces to, to again, really, truly change a culture uh, to one that fosters and rewards initiative instead of cuts heads off when, when somebody gets too much initiative and is too successful. Uh, a, a culture that is one of looking after one's soldiers first rather than oneself, uh, of leading all the Iraqis in your formation, not just those from your tribe, political party, or ethnic group, and, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, 
we talk about our very young leaders. Uh, this is the young, the young lieutenants, uh, the young sergeants, sometimes young captains. They're individuals who are the ones who are out on the hasty cordon, if you will, on the hasty traffic control point. Uh, they're the ones who are having to make decisions that are even beyond life or death in their, in their consequences. They can have truly strategic consequences, depending on, on what happens in a particular case. Uh, and we've seen some cases where, where actions, that some, some of which clearly were wrong, have had strategic uh, consequences that have rebounded uh, on us very, very severely. Um, Commanders have a huge obligation to them, and we talk about this a lot at Fort Leavenworth, in fact, because we have a, what's called the pre-command course. All future battalion commanders, brigade commanders, and command sergeants major come through there. We have a class once a month, and we always, in fact, we give some of these same points to them. And this is one that we really emphasize. Commanders have got to, in their training, prepare the young leaders, these young strategic corporals and lieutenants, uh, for the situations in which they're going to find themselves. We're in the blink of an eye, they're having to make a life or death decision. And then we've got to help them by giving them very simple technology, if you will, simple tactics, techniques, procedures, so that you can, in fact, stop a vehicle with something other than bullets uh, through the windshield. Now, let me tell you that there is no tougher security environment that I've ever seen in my career than that which is in Iraq. When you have an enemy who is willing to strap explosives to his or her, body and blow you up or drive a vehicle la laced with explosives into you and take your own life, that is a totally different dimension than anything we have ever encountered uh, before, certainly in any of our recent history. Uh, it creates an environment that is very, very difficult for our soldiers. And, uh, and we, on one hand, need to be sympathetic to them. On the other hand, we've got to prepare them better uh, and again, we have to help them uh, as much as we possibly can. For what it's worth, we, I do oversee these combat training centers that Professor Allison mentioned. Uh, we put on, they're almost little epic movies. We have, you know, 1,800 sort of role players, if you will. 300 of them are actually Iraqis. When you're doing a prep for an Iraqi mission, we also have Afghans in an area in the Mojave Desert the size of Rhode Island. Um, 12 villages out there, uh, and, and again, very, very realistic in terms of what they have to confront out there, and it, they confront a continuous counterinsurgency now. It's not the old Clash of the Titans that we had two or three years ago, where it's big tank battles out there, refighting Desert Storm again and again and again. That helped us enormously in the fight to Baghdad, but it is not, does not prepare our soldiers for what they're encountering downrange right now. Next slide, please. The flexible, adaptable leaders that, that our country has uh, provided uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan have been of enormous importance. And again, there's a number of them actually in this room, and it's, and it's really uh, gratifying, frankly, in, uh, to see them. These are individuals like these two Marines over here. Actually, stand up, why don't you, Seth and Ann? Uh, they're credits to your university. Actually, Seth was a Harvard graduate before, Ann is an HBS now. Um, these were armies of one, even though they were Marines. They were individuals who were so extraordinarily good at helping the rebuilding process that, you know, the good old talent scout team out there spotted them. Uh, they were in an area where we had very few U.S. forces. It was the Polish Multinational Division, uh, south of Baghdad, about a five-province area. And we clearly needed some folks who could spend U.S. dollars and, again, do it correctly. By the way, also do it very skillfully, so in a way that everybody's happy at the end of the day, which is an enormous challenge uh, in that environment where everybody ha wants his tribe to get the contract or his brother-in-law to get it or you name it, you know the deal. These two actually were down there. We call them Team Phoenix, uh, and they did absolutely unbelievable work down there. They reported directly to a three-star general, which drove the staff and subordinate levels of command absolutely crazy. Uh, and the answer to every request that they ever sent in was yes. And, uh, and as a result, they got an enormous amount of work done. Um, they spent, I think Ann spent as much in her time in six months down there uh, as the entire 101st was able to spend, uh, was allowed to spend uh, in the North, which also gives you a sense of how much more in terms of additional resources were committed to that. Some of that Iraqi money, by the way. But that's the kind of flexible, adaptable leader that was doing something for which I guarantee you they had not been trained in the Marine Officer Basic Course or any of their other uh, training uh, prior to deploying to Iraq. Thanks to both of you. Cool.
Now, the question that we have to answer for, I mean, the military leadership clearly has to say, okay, how can we do this even better? How can we produce more flexible, adaptable leaders? How do we produce more uh, lieutenants like uh, Ann and Seth? Uh, and the answer is, I think, sort of twofold. One is, again, this out of the intellectual comfort zone experience. You know, how, what does prepare you for operating in a different culture? Well, how about studying in a different culture? You know, I, I recounted to them earlier today, I remember going from um, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, the Command and General Staff College as a captain, uh, to uh, graduate school off that New Jersey turnpike exit. And uh, there I was, and you know, at Fort Leavenworth, this is in the days of the nuclear stuff. In fact, we were reading, you know, that in those days this was preventable and all, it was great, you know, and no first use and all, or we had the gang, what was the gang of four, then it became the gang of eight. Anyway, all the nuclear priesthood and the wizards of Armageddon, and so a big debate was 100 MX missiles or 200 MX missiles. This was fighting words out at Fort Leavenworth. I mean, this is irreconcilable differences. Well, you know, you go to graduate school, Princeton, and uh, gosh, there are some folks that had a pretty pretty logical train of thought that said perhaps you should have uh, no MX missiles. Maybe land-based missiles with MIRVs on the top of them are destabilizing. Wow. Uh, then there are others that say maybe we should have no land-based missiles at all because any land-based missiles are destabilizing because of the way they can be targeted despite the hardening and all the rest. Perhaps they should all be at sea or in the air. Then there are some that said, of course, by the way, you should also have an explicit declaration of no first use. And You know, you see where I'm going with this. I mean, there are some people who said you should have no weapons at all. Uh, there was one phenomenal professor who I, I personally liked enormously who actually asked me to be a teaching assistant for him at one point, which was, was pretty amazing. But, you know, the truth is we never disagreed on anything but substance. <laughs> and, and, it, and it is actually that is a pretty good experience. And, uh, and it's a pretty eye-opening one, and it was one that, you know, we gained enormously from. And, you know, you couldn't go back with your buddies each day and say, can you believe what that guy said? It doesn't work. And it was all about the power of ideas, about the logic of your position, and sorting out what are the assumptions on which people have based, again, have erected this line of reasoning uh, uh, on which they're operating. So again, very, very key. The other one is trying to get people into jobs, we think, that expose them to, to senior leaders, and they're still in the room when the door closes and the senior leader is truly at being candid. You know, it's being the senior military assistant to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, frankly. Uh, it is being, you know, the, I don't know, the, the exec to the chairman or something like the chairman of the Joint Chief. These kinds of jobs where you're seeing very senior folks uh, living extraordinary pressures uh, and grappling with them, and you see them when the doors close, when there's real candor, uh, and that's a challenging thing uh, these days with blogs and uh, email and all the rest of that that's going on out there. Next slide, please. The, uh, the, the last uh, observation and the one that we really uh, underscore the importance of with the future commanders out at Fort Leavenworth is this one about the most important job of a commander is to determine what the right tone should be and then to communicate that tone uh, through his subordinate leaders uh, to his uh, troopers, his soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. Now, what does the tone mean? Well, to some degree, it's act, I mean, in some ma very major respects, it's the right ethical tone. It is, including how are we going to treat detainees? I mentioned an anecdote earlier. We had a detainee uh, abuse problem in the 101st one. Early on, uh, somebody found it. It was reported. We took action against it. Actually relieved the individual involved. But we then sat down, had a little counsel with the, with the uh, I had some phenomenal lawyers. I forgot to mention, I had 28 operational lawyers, and I do not... Uh, tolerate jokes about operational military lawyers in my presence because they are wonderful people and you can, you know, <clears throat> they're, you can throw them at a problem and they can give you a concise, well-reasoned, uh, well-written, uh, overnight uh, argument and justification or rationale. We sat down and said, okay, look, how are we going to deal with this thing? There's different, uh, you know, we, what do we call these guys? There's a big debate in Washington, as you'll recall, about what they're and finally, we just said, look, just do use the Geneva Convention. It's the only thing we know, and conventional forces will leave the rest of it to others. But that's uh, the, the kind of first-order decision on occasion that you have to make. Uh, and then, of course, you've got to communicate that. And in fact, we did, and we made a big issue out of the, the case. We then, by the way, also invited 
the Red Cross, the two, the Imam and the Province Council, the two women on the Province Council, um, and some others into the detention facilities that we had everywhere on at least a weekly basis. It was also a good check and it meant one time that I didn't have to do it. So, uh, very important stuff. Kinetic versus non-kinetic, you know, how, what are we going to do here? Are we going to be looking for a fight all the time? In which case, boy, in a place like Iraq, that, you can find a fight. That may be all you find, though, if that is your, if you are constantly looking for that. We used to talk about the importance of a soldier leaving the, the patrol base every day with a wrench in one hand and a rifle in the other. Or being prepared for not just a hand grenade, but a handshake. And oh, by the way, if somebody off, puts his hand out, grab the darn thing and shake it big time and, and then start building on that and seeing what you can do. In other words, what's the mix of lethal and non-lethal? It's a very, very important, and it does change. There, when it, things get very, very tough, occasionally we said, I'm going to stop, we're stopping smiling, we want to show the population we're unhappy with them right now, I'm going to go on television and say that to them in a long speech uh, and, and explain how disappointed and bitterly uh, frustrated we are by the fact that they're not helping us right now, and actually then it helped and we got the intelligence and we went after, in fact, that was a, before we did the 35 targets. That kind of, uh, again, of approach, very important. Uh, you know, I, I even mentioned this polite, you know, we, we go to great lengths in a culture like Iraq, which is very hospitable, is very respectful, uh, by and large, and, and a lot of other very great qualities. Uh, and we try to reciprocate. And again, you know, uh, dignity and respect shouldn't be just, you know, given to those that wear an American flag on their right shoulder. So, but there are times, actually, on the other hand, we had to remind people, you know, it's okay to show that you do not have limitless patience. And every now and then, you actually need to pound the table and say, that is it. That's it. We are not going to start every session each morning by renegotiating what we agreed to yesterday. And if that's how we're going to do business, I'm going to walk out right now, and you get up, and you know, you hope somebody grabs you before you get out the door. And they did, thankfully. But I mean, that is what you have to do on occasion. Now, you don't want to do it in a way that isn't, creates a non-biodegradable uh, relationship after that. In other words, you, where you do a, a, a mortal wound to that relationship uh, because you need to end up hugging at the end of the day. Next slide, please. Okay, those are some observations, uh, and, and I appreciate your patiently listening to those, and I'd be very, very happy now to take your questions. I think that's a uh, great uh, overview. It's obviously uh, tips of a lots of icebergs. Let me suggest how we're going to do the questions and answers. There are microphones here on the floor on either side and in the loges. The uh, ground rules here say uh, one question per customer. Uh, questions are short. They can be on any topic, but they're short, not speeches. And they end with a question mark. And we're starting with this gentleman. Please introduce yourselves, too. Thank you. My name is Donald Barrett. I'm a graduate of the college and the parent of a senior at the college. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Um, in the private sector and in the military, in general, leaders who are uh, change agents, who are able to fight bureaucracies to the ground and uh, eliminate waste are uh, the kind of leadership you're going, uh, looking uh, towards. I was struck by your description of reconstructing the University of Mosul. Um, and the heroic efforts you under, undertook to get that up and running. I thought, uh, in an, if, an example, what, what would have happened if you'd had sufficient resources on the ground to eliminate the looting to the bare walls of the university originally uh, after the invasion was finished? Um, and David Brooks, who's a columnist for the New York Times, made the point that the leadership that's efficient and change agents is great in the military except with one very serious exception which is in times of war when the uncertainty of the fog of war requires excess capacity, uh, waste, excessive resources so that when uh, the situation on the ground is realized you have the capacity to change. Um, as someone who's uh, collating the lessons learned of this war, uh, do you agree with that thesis and maybe you could share with us one or two of the real takeaways if you could play back the tape sure. and uh, start the war over. Let me uh, start with the second Thank one. You. you know, there, 
there's you know a great case on having in a sense having redundancy I mean if you particularly if you're not sure exactly what the right move is let's have a little com competition out there for who can get the best intelligence who can do whatever which is not a bad thing but there's an if and only if and that is if you have exce excessive resources are great if you have excessive resources and uh, I think there's a point at which there are very distinct limits uh, on what our forces uh, can do particularly over time uh, and as I think you know you know the army is in fact uh, working extremely hard right now by the way, we have made the reenlistment mission or the uh, the recruiting mission, I think, for about 10 months straight now, and the reenlistment remains very, very much above 100%. And we are watching the uh, departure of captains, but right now it is right at about the historic 10-year norm. It is up from what it was after 9/11. But these factors, where there's a lot of canaries in the mine shaft that we're watching for our army, uh, and obviously it would help the army, uh, just strictly from an institutional point of view. Um, if, in fact, there can be a bit longer dwell time for those brigades that return from a place like Iraq or Afghanistan. So, again, as an academic proposition, I, th I would agree uh, that, you know, it's great to have other folks out there and, and again, sort of almost a competition among people, but, it, but it's if and only if you have excessive resources, and I'm not sure that applies uh, in this case. Um, let me tell you about the looting, uh, because there's a, I, I wouldn't say there's mythology about that, but um, and, and certainly we probably should, uh, could have done better in that regard. But I will tell you that the looting was happening in advance of us actually coming into places. I remember coming into the biblical city of Babylon for actually Babel province. The city is Hilla, but just north of Hilla is the biblical city of Babylon, uh, over which, by the way, Saddam built his own little hill and a palace on top of it overlooking it uh, to give you a sense. But I remember we were fighting in the south of Hilla, uh, and we finally destroyed, beat, defeated the guys that were, that were fighting us, and um, we entered the military compound, and the military compound was already looted. I mean, it was horrifically looted, and in fact, the soldiers had taken virtually everything with them um, when they went, apparently, and then I think civilians had immediately come in right after that uh, and, and taken anything else, literally before we even got there. And this was the case in many, many different places. Uh, Mosul, you, you may recall, sort of fell of its own weight. And what happened was one of the huge assumptions that proved unfounded was that Iraqis will, in fact, stay at their posts, protect their ministry facilities, that the soldiers will stay in their barracks as opposed to just completely deserting. The fact is they did the worst of two worlds because we were watching some, there were some real bellwether units that we were watching as we went into Iraq. You'll recall we attacked in along here, uh, right in here, uh, the 11th motorized regiment or division was a unit we, we really thought would, the intelligence world told us that's a unit that's going to capitulate and they'll stay in place. They'll turn the turrets of their tanks uh, over the rear deck and just stay there and, and they will, in fact, protect what they have. And we, we very much hoped that would be true. Lo and behold, they ended up fighting. They fought long enough that we, in fact, you know, ended up really pounding them. Then they all took off, uh, of course, after that, and then you had, and then and there was a ripple effect gradually throughout the country. We'd have a stiff fight. Uh, some folks were taking off uh, and all the rest. So, you know, if, could we, if we could have prevented looting somehow, uh, and the only way you're going to prevent that, the only way was for Iraqis to stay in their post. If, if the fourth ID had come through the north through Turkey, it would have helped. But I'll tell you, we were shoving stuff through Kuwait as fast as stuff could come through it. So I'm at a little at a loss. I mean, we ran out of, darn near ran out of fuel and all the rest of that as fast as we went anyway. Um, and, uh, I mean, that was one reason that we had to, had to uh, consolidate the position outside Najaf, then go into Najaf, and then 3rd Infantry Division continued because they were waiting for the 5,000-gallon tankers all to come back up in their 300-mile uh, one-way trip in the middle of a dust storm that lasted two and a half days. So um, there's a real big, in a sense, assumption in there that if we just shot a few looters that, you know, all this looting would have stopped. And I, I'm not one who buys that necessarily. I, I do indeed. When we went to Mosul, the first thing we did was we put some soldiers on the antiquities sites, the museum, and a few others, and it did prevent anything further uh, at those locations. But again, you're talking about a country with 27 to 30 million people in it, uh, and 
you're not going to have that many that you can get on the ground that quickly that can deal with that kind of thing when it starts to go like that. When, when thousands and thousands and thousands of people descend on a facility, uh, it's like ants at a picnic, and it, and it is gone just like that. So, um, yeah, could we, should we, you know, you got it uh, in truth, um, but, but I'll tell you that this is, uh, unless folks are going to stay on the job, and that was a big, big shortcoming, okay, uh, not going to. We, had, we have about uh, 20 questions, and we don't have 20 minutes, so we're going to okay. have to do short questions and short answers, and this gentleman in the lodge is next. My name is Andre Stein. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. My question is, how secure are Iraq's land borders, and how has Iraqi border security affected the numbers and the influx of foreign fighters joining the insurgency? Um, it's a great question. In fact, we put a lot of effort into uh, rebuilding. I don't know if you can show the slide that talks about border forts, but uh, Rock has a huge land border, and some of these are very, very open areas. These are, and the distances here are phenomenal. To go from Baghdad to the border with Jordan, for example, takes three refuelings in a Black Hawk helicopter. I mean, this is some serious distance. So think about the distances that you've got here. And again, think about from here to here, again, is about the distance of... Uh, at least New York to Boston, or actually probably Washington to uh, New York. Um, so big borders, uh, a lot of them just sheer open desert, uh, and, uh, and, and again, all the border forts also had been literally taken apart for the rebar uh, because we sure weren't out on the borders very quickly in the beginning. We eventually took, it started about a year and a half ago or so, in fact, Duke DeLuca there, this is one of his science projects, you can see 258 border forts total, uh, and we now, this is actually a dated slide. This is about a month old, uh, but you can see that we rebuilt about 226 of those. Training of the border forces has also gone forward. The challenge, candidly, is actually at the official border crossings. We have got to get the customs and the others. Um, it, there's got to be real integrity there. There has to be a sense of professionalism. There can't be intimidation and all the rest. Uh, and that is a big, big effort. We had the Department of Homeland Security helping with their board tax and customs uh, advisors, and that, that's, uh, they had a transformational effect at those locations uh, while they were there. So that effort is, is very much coming along. Uh, it's a big challenge, and there's no question that in er certain areas from Syria and then clearly areas from Iran that there's cross-border infiltration of a variety of types uh, that include just basic smuggling, uh, as well as certainly uh, people coming in to help the insurgents. We did have a big campaign literally to go from border fort to border fort because all these have been blown up by the insurgents. We literally had to establish a border fort, get supplies in it, then go secure the next one so that contractors could even get in there and reconstruct it, uh, and then literally did it one by one by one in an extraordinary, and you had to fight for some of them. Not an easy task, and, uh, and that one is still very much ongoing. Gentlemen in the right loads, please. Uh, my name is Andrew Fong. I'm an uh, undergraduate to college. Uh, my question is, a lot of the things you described seem to be non-traditional military roles, uh, things that the State Department, uh, development agencies, even FEMA, might have uh, a little bit of expertise in doing. To what extent does the military work with other government agencies to uh, coordinate reconstruction? Well, very, very closely, and um, I mean extraordinarily closely. Uh, and, and, of course, needless to say, you know, all the assistance is, is gratefully received, encouraged, um, and certainly there has been uh, lots of effort to try to, uh, to get everyone as involved as is possible. The challenge is that you don't have, that the security situation is so very difficult uh, that, that to get someone over there and to keep them there, I mean, you almost have, you know, to get to and from work in a ministry building you at the very least have to have an armed patrol uh, take you over there. Uh, and of course, there's a sense of unease. I mean, people that are working in the Treasury Department at Washington did not generally sign up for the kind of mission uh, that that represents here. And so again, you, you have to get a different uh, individual to help advise these ministries uh, and, and so on. Um, and I mean, there are very few NGOs uh, really functioning at any high level in Iraq as well other than some that are certainly operating up above the former green zone will dip down periodically, some operating out of the south. Again, you know, the this, this southern uh, nine provinces actually are really doing relatively well, certainly problems that Iraqis can deal with. There's lots of squabbling between the different Shia factions on occasion in various places. 
but that's stuff they can deal with. It's the insurgent areas, those portions of six provinces uh, that really cause the challenges, uh, really the, the so-called Sunni Triangle area like this. Um, so uh, again, really tough uh, environment to work in uh, and, and that is, needless to say, a, a pretty substantial deterrent to the normal kinds of activity that you would have found, say, in Bosnia, Kosovo, or even still today in Afghanistan. I came home through Afghanistan, for whatever it's worth. Secretary Rumsfeld asked me to come through there and to do an assessment of their training and equip mission. And I was really astonished at the difference in, in a sense, the environment and the feel uh, of that situation. Good evening. My name is Bill Glucroft. I'm a junior journalism major at Emerson College. First, I want to thank you for your service and to our country, and I hope that your work and the work of under your people under your command will soon start to yield some positive benefits sooner rather than later. My question uh, goes a little beyond Iraq and more of just global diplomacy. Um, maybe you could share with us some of your observations in working with people of other countries and other cultures uh, and what you see needs to happen uh, here on, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, to bridge the gap uh, that extremists on both sides are exploiting to create a more, that are creating a more chaotic world in order to shift the paradigm to a more stable, more peaceful, more, more democratic world that I think we all would like to achieve. Well, um, we, we discussed a little bit of this earlier today. Believe it or not, one of the biggest steps we can do is to get them in our universities. Uh, and as you recall, after 9-11, I think appropriately that the number of folks coming in took a big dip. But we need to look very, very hard uh, at whatever actions might limit that kind of access. And in fact, we need to be trying to push that back up. I can tell you that in a place like Afghanistan, for example, some of those ministries are, are carried by one or two or three individuals who had a Western education. You know, the one Afghan general who is a U.S. Army Ranger School graduate, I mean, he's got the whole crowd in his, sort of on his back. They're so very, very important in that regard. So number one is we've got to try to, to keep them engaged uh, with us as much as we can to reach out to offer. By the way, we have two Iraqi uh, lieutenant colonels out at Fort Leavenworth in the Commander General Staff College, two Afghans. And on Friday, next, a week from tomorrow, we're going to go to the graduation of the first Iraqi student at the U.S. Army Ranger School in about 35 years. So knock on wood. Um, that he will make it all the way through, but he's going doing fine so far. Uh, so that's one component of this. The other is, of course, we've got to, um, you know, make sure that we have a degree of, you know, the other thing I learned in graduate school is a degree of intellectual humility. And, um, you know, again, it's a pretty good little cautionary tale to realize that there's a heck of a lot of smart folks out there, and there's a lot of them that are, aren't, aren't in the United States, by the way, as we all know here. And um, and I think, again, that's, that's not a bad attitude to have uh, as we approach the problems of the world and certainly welcome the assistance uh, of others over there. I was a NATO commander in Iraq as well, by the way. And it's sort of, a, you know, it was a much smaller mission. Um, I loved the heck out of it, actually, because they would require you on occasion to come to Brussels, which was about the only time I ever got out of Iraq in two and a half years. <laughs> but, um, you know, there, there was enormous value in that mission. And uh, yeah, it wasn't as easy as doing it all ourselves, but you can't do it all yourself. And, uh, and so we got to remember that, having done it in Bosnia as well. David, at the, at the lunch today, uh, somebody asked you about uh, how you found dealing with other cultures uh, or out of, uh, what do you say, out of your intellectual right. zone comfort. And they were particularly asking about dealing with Secretary Rumsfeld. Uh, and you, you, had, you had a very good. Uh, that was one off the record up there, wasn't it? No. <laughs> I thought you had a very good one-liner. So let me. Well, uh, let me uh, encourage you, if you're willing, yeah, to offer it to us. As uh, as Professor Allison mentioned, uh, I did a PhD there at Princeton, and uh, I had a committee. And you know, the committees do their job. I mean, they wire brush you. And uh, I had a particularly good and aggressive and, and very, very sharp professor who happens now to be a named professor over at MIT, Barry Posen, and he made sure that I earned my, my thumbs up from the oral exam. Um, that was far tougher, frankly, than any briefing that I ever had with uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. And I'm not you know, going to try to head down that road or anything like that, but my dealings were in the course of uh, a number of very, very tough uh, cases that, um, you know, occasionally you got to act like a New Yorker and lean back into 
somebody who's invaded your personal space. But if you have a solid foundation, if you've had guys challenge you in your preparation, if your facts are reasonably sound and your logic isn't too bad, um, you know, you're going to do okay, is my impression. Well, for, for those of you who survived being grilled by our colleague Barry Posen, you know, okay, that's good training. So here we are on the left hand side. Yes, Victor Les Brown from Salem. Uh, you did your thesis on uh, the lessons of Vietnam, and um, one lesson I think we all should have learned was to thank you, to welcome you home. Well, thanks. So, um, my question is, do you think that uh, we underestimated the ability of the enemy to uh, learn lessons himself prior to the uh, invasion? And uh, to segue in then to uh, what you think the future of Army aviation is, given the performance there as well as in Somalia and other uh, theaters of operation? Um, first of all, in a sense, it's funny because the, the enemy in certain respects was far less than we expected. I mean, we thought we'd have some pretty pitched battles with the Republican Guards and some other, you know, there are some pretty good formations over there and some pretty good equipment and large numbers of tanks and everything else. We did have a couple of very, very tough fights, very, very tough fights, but they were nothing like what we expected with the main conventional and, and uh, Republican Guards units or the special Republican Guards. It ended up being these paramilitaries, the Fedeen, the Coots, the Ba'ath Militia, and some others. Uh, and, and in fact, we did have to adjust to that, and we did. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what militaries do. Now, the enemy since then, the, the insurgents that emerged, um, certainly have proven to be very flexible and adaptable. They've taken uh, technology and used it in very, very e effective and efficient ways. They're a learning enemy, and we have to therefore be a learning army. And, it, and it, there's an enormous contest, in a sense, going on. Uh, they'll learn how to detonate something remotely. We try to learn how to deal with that and prevent that, and then they learn how to do it another way. And then there's a, you know, it, it, I don't want to get into the technologies because we're very sensitive to that. But uh, this is ongoing big time, and, uh, and it's an enemy who also very, very effectively uses information operations in many cases and, of course, comes from that culture and therefore has a pretty big advantage to begin with. Army aviation, I think, um, I think we be, need to be very, very careful not to overlearn the lessons of one engagement, that of the 11th Attack Helicopter Regiment, which is a unit working for the uh, Corps headquarters. Uh, we used, frankly, many, many different deep attack operations with Apaches, had enormous success with them. Um, we had dust problems, but, but we, every time we packaged everything properly, we had uh, considerable success. We destroyed two divisions, Iraqi divisions worth of uh, mechanized and armor equipment, by the way. So, uh, again, they were very effective. And we also did a, a large number of raids. If you can put that slide back up, just to give you an example of what was done. And these are, were very, they were not covered because we didn't want them to be. But at the time that we were up here, there was very light coverage of coalition forces out here in the beginning. And we could get intelligence. We knew where the enemy was, was staging and training down here. So we flew over 100, air, 100 aircraft one time down to Al-Assad Air Base. You could sprinkle them around, literally hide them on this huge, massive air base, and then wait for the intelligence indicators that told us who was where, and, and we got them. And then we would go and pounce on them with uh, air assault operations. We did three major operations like that down there, uh, very big packages together, had enormous success with it, and also did a very, very large operate up here uh, where there were there were absolutely, and because they were there on the ground, and, uh, some 60 to 70 uh, insurgents who had followed in uh, and were settled up in wadis with hundreds and hundreds of RPG uh, launchers, thousands of rounds, uh, all kinds of small arms uh, and other munitions and explosives and everything else, and, uh, and we also did them as well. Uh, again, these were not covered because at the time we didn't want that capability uh, to be revealed, frankly. Then once the, we got bigger coverage in that area of coalition forces, that was not necessary to do that. But that capability is still there. We still need to practice it and exercise it and uh, not to give it up because one mission on one night uh, ran into a real uh, tough storm of small arms fire. I'm Paula Broadwell, a Ph.D. student here at the Kennedy School and active Army Reserve Officer, probably one who is uh, in the intellectually challenged zone, as you were mentioning. Um, my question has to do with the uh, training of Iraqi security forces. Mm -hmm. I had the chance to visit the Amman Training Center in uh, March of last year uh -huh. and was very impressed with the facilities, the instructors from around the world, um, the curriculum. It's even better now. 
My concern at the time was that the program was only six weeks long. And oh, no, it was always, even then when you visited it. This is another, I, I, sorry to do this, but I've had that so many times. It's eight weeks in Jordan, and then we added on another two weeks uh, uh, that they get. when they, And then the, the courses that are in Iraq are all ten weeks now, even just for the basic courses. And there's a whole host of special uh, courses as well. Um, the reason it's only eight weeks in Jordan is because they're away for their family. This is a big deal uh, in the Arab culture, not to be away from your family too long. And remember, by the way, if they don't take pay home, the family doesn't eat. So we literally had to get them back uh, after about eight weeks is about as long as we could keep them over there. But go, keep going. Um, well, you answered one question. Uh, I guess <laughs> if the training has changed, but I understood there was a high defection rate that about 60%, which is probably... No, okay, that's the leakage issue, and that was another... Um, there was leakage between uh, policemen who would be trained in Amman, Jordan, would then come back uh, to Iraq and then would go out to their locations and either wouldn't show up or, uh, or if they showed up would not be taken on. It was never anywhere near that number to begin with. Um, there, I, I don't want to use that homonyms, but there are certain folks that, that were a little bit disgruntled about things and that would, would spread some of this stuff. Um, that leakage rate then was solved because what we did was before they would, were allowed to leave Amman, I insisted that the Minister of Interior give them their actual assignments. Part of the problem really was that they would come back to Baghdad and then there's a big squabble over who was going to be assigned where and some guys would just give up and go home. Uh, and so we solved that again and then there was also a pay issue that we had to solve. But these became so important that as a three-star uh, action officer, I had to go in and solve these with the minister, which gives you a sense, again, of what you have to do sometimes to deal with the bureaucracy. Again, still not perfect, uh, but, but got a very good handle. Same with Baghdad. In fact, we tracked it in my morning updates, as the Duke will tell you, um, with the staff in uh, the Multinational Security Transition Command, Iraq, as to whether or not they had their assignments yet. It's a big matrix because there's about eight or nine uh, academies around the country that just that do the basic course. There's about 8,000 students in, in school at any one time, about 3,200 outside the country, by the way, at any given time. That's another sort of mythology that, you know, you're not taking advantage of training outside the country. I don't think we could fly any more of them in and out of the country, um, especially given the airspace challenges and all that stuff. But there's about 3,200 at any given time on average, mostly 3,100 in Jordan, and then on average another 100 sprinkled around at various NATO schools, various Western uh, countries, uh, occasionally packages of them down in Qatar, uh, a UAE, or other places like that. With apologies to the other folks, we're going to take the last question from the Lodge, this lady, and I apologize for the other people who are up. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Deborah Kaufman. I'm a graduate student from Boston here. My question is about um, your decision to relinquish, as it was said in our insert here, your post, uh, the multinational um, in Iraq coming to Fort Leavenworth. Uh, I don't know if that's how you would describe it. You relinquished your post. But at any rate, uh, I'd like to know what motivated you to make that switch. Well, I and, mean, it um, wasn't up to me. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, w I didn't fight it, I will tell you. But, I mean... You know, the Army has to fill other assignments. Yes, this is crucially important. You've got to remember, I was deployed for over three and a half years uh, of about a four and a half year period. I saw my son six months out of his four years of high school and we moved him three times. I'm not saying, you know, that we were on the brink of divorce or anything. You know, my wife was doing fine. In fact, they probably did better. By the way, my son's over there. He did okay. He got into MIT uh, and is, is doing fine over there. He's a freshman. Um, but you know, there is a time at which somebody needs to bring you home. And, uh, and I know, you know, Senator McCain and a few others were, were a bit concerned about that. We had exactly the right guy to follow me, though, and, and they had been tracking that, Lieutenant General Marty Dempsey, actually a West Point classmate of mine, a fellow division commander in Iraq, terrific officer. Uh, the Army does try to position people for future assignments as well, and I wish you could have gotten the briefing that I gave at lunchtime because I think you would understand the magnitude of the current job, which the Army Chief of Staff was told me he wanted me to get into. So there's a little bit of a, you know, Army wants you home. Some other folks would be happy to leave you there for uh, who knows how long. Um, but there's also a, again, there's, you have to get somebody in position for future things on occasion as well, and they claimed that that was some of that also. But 
uh, it's a privilege to be what I'm doing, to do what I'm doing right now, overseeing these, you know, 18 or 19 different schools and centers throughout America, uh, and helping our Army be a learning organization uh, through all the different functions. We have this slide called the Engine of Change that we talked through in great detail today at lunch, and uh, and that is in fact uh, what I'm overseeing. And and candidly, it's exact. I think that you know we need folks who have had that kind of experience in those positions, so that we can in fact. Uh, change our doctrine, our theory, our concepts, our, our core uh, principles, uh, ensure that our leaders are trained on them, and we oversee all leader training, all non-commissioned, commissioned, and warrant officer training throughout the United States of the Army. Uh, we then oversee the places where they practice it, one of those, that place out in the Mojave Desert that I talked about that now looks like the Sunni Triangle when they go through, that's a huge change. Uh, there's another one in Louisiana, there's a virtual combat training center that we do with simulations for the very large units. And we're developing the simulations, by the way, even to have now non-kinetic effects models, which is a pretty big leap forward. And then we have an organization that collects observations, insights, and lessons throughout the world, including in combat, uh, where we're embedded with everybody and send out teams to do these assessments, and then provide that feedback back to the folks who write the doctrine, the folks that do the seminars, the folks that do the scenarios, all of it enabled by an organization that we have that does true knowledge management, that underwrites virtual communities, allows someone in the United States to virtually look over the shoulder of the people who are in Iraq, for example, and look at their information displays, what their situation reports today, right now, say, and that type of thing. And again, all in the hope that we are helping our Army be uh, a learning organization. So, um, you know, I think it's a Again, it really is a great privilege and a wonderful responsibility and a very enjoyable one for what it's worth. And, and candidly, it's sort of nice to be able to take your wife out to dinner more than once a year as well. <laughs> David, you wanted to make a, a final comment. I did, sir, if I could. I, I, I sort of feel an obligation uh, to those with whom I was privileged to serve in Iraq just to offer a final thought. Uh, and it is that I really strongly believe that all Americans should appreciate what their soldiers, sailors, airmen, uh, and Marines have done and are doing for their country. Uh, there have been absolutely missteps along the way, some of them very serious. But for each individual who failed to live up to the standards that our country expects of its soldiers, there have been thousands of others who have selflessly gone about their duty, doing what our country asked them to do, enduring separation from loved ones, battling a truly barbaric enemy, grappling with the complexities and frustrations of operating in a culture that is very different from our own, and in some cases shedding blood or even giving the last full measure of devotion in carrying out a particular mission. Tom Brokaw, who many of you know from television, but also of course wrote the book The Greatest Generation about the World War II generation, came out and spent some time with us uh, up in the 101st in northern Iraq, and after a particularly great day, before getting on a helicopter to head back to Baghdad, he grabbed me and he said, you know, General, that World War II crowd, that was the greatest generation. But these young soldiers that I've seen today, this is the new greatest generation. And I agreed with him then, and I still do. Repeatedly in Iraq, I saw the concept of the Army of One slogan played out as soldier after soldier, Marine after Marine, proved to be the decisive individual in the performance of a particular task on a particular point in the battlefield. And I often wondered, in fact, especially while watching our soldiers rendering the final salute to a fallen comrade after a memorial ceremony, where does our country find such individuals, young men and women who, despite the personal flaws that we all have, serve so selflessly and in the face of enormous challenges, repeatedly demonstrate impressive initiative, determination, innovativeness, and courage. I raise this because as the discussion over Iraq continues, it's my hope that our country will never turn its back on those in uniform who have done what our country asked them to do, even though that duty required enormous sacrifice and entailed substantial hardship. And so this evening at this incomparable university, before this wonderful group of students, faculty, and citizens, I want to express my hope that our country will never forget and never fail to honor the sacrifices of those who wear and have worn our country's uniform. Thank you very much.
Let me just express on behalf of all of us how proud we are to have uh, David and so many other uh, folks here serving and how much we look forward to his coming back. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, John. Thanks, John.